it's book four of the Aeneid today. And um, I tend to deal with this book on its own uh, because it's so significant culturally. And it's almost a, uh, it is a bit of a side note within the context of the whole story because Aeneas, having left Troy, ends up not on the north side of the Mediterranean in Italy, but rather on the south side of the Mediterranean in what is uh, today Libya. And that is the historic venue for the empire of Carthage, which becomes Rome's great enemy. So back in ancient history, we think of ancient history as Roman history, but in ancient Roman history, at its early beginnings, there are two powers that have arisen around the Mediterranean. The Greeks have gone down, right? Alexander the Great dies, and with him, his Greek empire is split up amongst his four generals, and the influence of Greek culture stays around the Mediterranean, even as the Romans spread out. Uh, Greek culture, the Greek language is still used by educators, and many of the, the, the Romans' uh, teachers, if you had a teacher, it would be a private tutor, uh, would be a Greek speaker. Your teacher would speak Greek to your, your son or your daughter, usually your son, the daughters didn't get it so much, and you would be taught in the Greek language and you'd learn to write and read the Greek language. So it became the language of, of education, and the Romans admired the Greeks for this, and we can see that in this epic. But, um, but politically, the Greeks were no longer a force, and the Romans became the force. And we know this, they became the empire. But before they became an empire, they had a rival, and this was Carthage. The Punic Wars, uh, figures like Hannibal, who came across the Alps on the uh, elephants and so forth, famous generals. And, uh, the, the battle for supremacy in the Mediterranean was fought over a couple of centuries. And Virgil, who is writing a Roman epic, is giving us an account of how Rome had its own epic beginnings against a political rival. In the same way the Trojans had the Greeks, the Romans have the Carthaginians. But we're not really dealing with the war between Carthage and Rome. We're looking at the beginnings of the two because the timeline is long before either of these is an empire. So Carthage at this point is just a city. It hasn't spread out. It's just being built up. But it's before Rome. And our friend Aeneas has been pushed there by the winds. And the temptation for him is to settle there. She's a, there's an African queen there who uh, is going to tempt him to stay, to stay there. And if he does that, then he is not going to achieve his aim that the gods have predestined, if you will, which is to ground the city of Rome. Rome will never be built if he stays in Carthage. So there's an imperial historic dynastic level on which you need to see this. Like these are, these are two great nations, not yet great, and two historical figures who are not yet as significant historically as they will be. They're just two people. They're two leaders. And the temptation is that the Rome, Rome which will be great, will never get off the ground. That's, that's the temptation here. And it comes about because of a battle between goddesses. And I talk, we talked about this already in the context of uh, the Greek epic, the battle between uh, Athena on the one hand and Poseidon, right? Poseidon didn't want Odysseus to get home. And Athena ended up prevailing there. Well, here we have a battle between the two other women that we hear about in the Iliad, uh, Venus on the one hand, and Juno on the other. Juno favors the Carthaginians. She's their goddess. Venus favors the Romans. 
So which of the goddesses is going to be victorious in this conflict? Well, um, in book four, we get something of a portrait here of the battle that goes on between the gods, which works its way out into a battle between two people who are potentially allied in, and the proposal is that they be married. But if that union succeeds, their empires will fail. Or at least one of their empires will fail, the Roman Empire, because they'll start up Carthage and Carthage will flourish, right? Because Carthage is already there and Aeneas will just stay there and Rome will never be born. And at that point, he will not have fulfilled his destiny and he will no longer be pious Aeneas. He will be a man who has lost his wife and has gained another one. And he'll have an empire. And he himself will be a very happy man. But what about Rome? And that's the conflict for him here. Uh, and we have to, I think we have to sense that there is a conflict here uh, within the two goddesses, within the two uh, monarchs, if you will, or leaders of their people, uh, within the two nations, and so you're reading it at multiple levels, and then we will even find that there's a conflict that goes so far that it will ignite a sort of a supernatural level of conflict, not just between the goddesses, but even the, the fire that will be shot through uh, the veins of Dido, the Carthaginian queen, is going to end up leading to her burning herself alive and taking her down to the fires of hell. So the fire that prompts Eros or Venus to get her in the throes of passion or lust for Aeneas will end up leading her to burn herself alive. And that will take her all the way down to the underworld where the same thing will happen. And we'll meet her again in book six in the underworld. I'll come to that next time. But there are multiple levels here. And let me start off with uh, just the beginning of book three. Uh, not the beginning of book three, the end of book three, where it's just talking about uh, Aeneas or, uh, telling his story of his voyages to Dido, because Dido asks Aeneas in the same way that the Phaeacians had asked Odysseus, who are you, where did you come from, how did you get here? She asks Aeneas this, he tells her his story, how he got there, and as he tells her his story, she is not only enthralled with what she hears, but this uh, heroic figure who's led his people, um, but she's also, she falls in love with him. And this is presented as a, uh, a, a trap, a trap set up by Venus. Remember, Venus is the goddess that Aeneas, that favors Aeneas. She realizes that there is a threat to her aim of establishing Rome, and that is Dido. Dido wants to keep him there, and so does Juno, because if he stays there, Rome will never exist. So she wants them to stay. On the other hand, Venus realizes, I have to get him out of there. How am I going to get him out of there? Now, it's counterintuitive what she proposes. I'm gonna make them fall in love. How is that gonna bring her down? Well, we're gonna find out and what she plays on are the, are the associations of love that are most um, dubious to Virgil, the poet. Remember I said he was a Stoic. And Stoics value above all things equanimity, level-headedness, even spiritedness. They want you to always stay on an even keel. Stoics, when we think of Stoics, think about the British ar archetype, the stiff, up, stiff upper lip. You deal with hardship without, and you deal with suffering without crying. Keep a, you know, a strong face there. Keep your demeanor, keep your cool. Uh, there are two threats to that. One of them is pain and war. The Stoics want to avoid war because uh, chaos results, anarchy. You can't be level-headed when the shells are raining around you, when the people beside you are getting 
stabbed and you yourself are getting hit. You can't be level-headed then. And when, the, when justice fails and a state fails and anarchy reigns, then nobody can be level-headed. So you need to keep peace. On the other hand, there's an even bigger threat and that is of attachments to those nearest and dearest to you. This one's counterintuitive. So a Stoic doesn't only want to keep his enemies away, he wants to keep his friends away. In particular, he doesn't want to love anything too much that it will put his state of inner tranquility at risk. So your, your beloved is actually your enemy because they can throw you off. Think about yourself. If you've fallen in love with somebody, what do you think about? that person all the time. What happens when you think about that person all the time? You will become a little bit, you lose detach, you become detached from reality. You literally become obsessed. What does it do to you? It upsets you. I saw that person with this person. I became jealous. For what? The things you imagined were happening. You don't, it doesn't even have to happen. Virgil observes all these things. These are the consequences of eros or of love particularly romantic love. And he sees them as uh, hostile to his model of heroism, which is a stoic model of heroism. And what he does in this book four is to demonstrate a war within the character of Queen Dido and where Eros or Venus or love, where this leads you not only astray, but down to the fires of hell. That's what's going to happen to her. She will take her own life. And she, she, being Venus, plans this to happen. And what, he, what she's doing to, to the reader is warning the reader, don't be like Dido. So if you um, are an aficionado of European culture, you'll notice that there are, there are operas of Dido and Aeneas. There are uh, famous classical uh, pieces arranged to it. And there are paintings, Dido and Aeneas here. This is in Carthage, pointing it, Queen Dido. And we will present Dido in those plays as a tragic heroine and as the, as the, as the uh, figure of sympathy. That's not how Virgil means us to read Dido. He wants her to be a warning. Do not be like Dido. She lost perspective. She gave up everything. She destroyed herself. She potentially destroyed her nation. She is the antithesis to Virgil's hero, who is Aeneas, who keeps his head and puts his self-interest on the back burner and thinks about his little son, Ulysses, and what will come in the future. He thinks about Rome. He doesn't think about Carthage, whereas Dido forgets Carthage and by pursuing her self-interest, destroys herself. It's, it's a, it's, she's a foil. In, in uh, drama, we talk about two characters being very similar, and one is the uh, sort of the mirror image of the one, but it's the opposite. She is the opposite of Dido, or of, uh, of Phineas. So don't think of her as the hero here. She is not the hero. She's the anti-hero. Very hard, because it, it, we see it as a great love story, and we have sympathy for her, and I think we should have sympathy for her. But then Virgil wants us to check our sympathies and really think about the consequences of falling in love without any reason, just being passionate. So it's very much of an anti-romantic love story. So I, I just say that because I regularly read about the tragedy of Dido and poor Dido, and Virgil to some degree even has sympathy for, and certainly Aeneas does. Aeneas genuinely loves Dido, I think. And that's, that is the power of the tale it's not because he didn't love her, it's because he did love her that he is heroic, because he puts her aside for the greater glory of Rome, for his little son, Eulus, for what will be. Anyway, book four, too late. The queen is caught between love's pain and press. She feels the wound within her veins. She is eaten by a secret flame. Aeneas, high name, all he has done again, again, come like a flood. His face, his words hold fast her breast. Care strips her limbs of calm and rest. 
A new dawn lights the earth with Phoebus's lamp and banishes damp shadows from the sky when restless Dido turns to her heart's sharer. Anna, my sister, what dreams make me shudder? Who is this stranger guest come to our house? How confident he looks, how strong his chest and arms. I think, and I have cause, that he is born of gods. For in the face of fear, the mean must fall. What fates have driven him? Remember fates here, when we talk about fates, we just use the word, the, they believe in the fates. There are goddesses that have driven here. It's destiny. The fates have meant him to be here. And she's thinking, I don't have a husband. Here's a man. The fates have driven him here. It's meant to be. That immediately conclusion, right? And it is meant to be. But why is it meant to be? What's the purpose? She thinks it's going to be a good purpose. She's dreaming, imagining that it would be so. Is it so? What fates have driven him here? What trying wars he lived to tell? Were it not my sure, immovable decision not to marry anyone since my first love turned traitor when he cheated me by death, were I not weary of the couch and torch, I might perhaps give way to this one fault. For I must tell you, Anna, since the time Sicius, my poor husband, died, and my own brother splashed our household gods with blood. Aeneas is the only man to move my feelings, to overturn my shifting heart. I know too well the signs of the old flame. Note the repeated references to fire here. It, you, mean, you can almost underline them. There's so many references to fire. And fire, remember, has already been associated with the burning of Troy. It's a destructive force. It destroys things including people. It starts here. But I should call upon the earth to gape and close above me, or on the Almighty Father to take his thunderbolt to hurl me down into the shades, the pallid shadows and deepest night of Erebus, before I'd violate you, shame, or break your laws. For he who had first joined me to himself has carried off my love, and may he keep it, and be its guardian within the grave. She spoke. Her breast became a well of tears. So she makes a vow. If I had not made this vow, I would give my heart to Aeneas, but I've made this vow and I will not break my vow. She's vowed to remain married to her husband even though her husband's dead. It's a strange vow. It's not a rational vow. Why would one make such a vow? She's gone from a, she's making an irrational uh, connection to a, a dead husband. But that is her character. She was attached to him. She doesn't think like a queen. A queen has no, doesn't have the liberty of remaining without a king. Others want her hand in marriage, and she needs to have children. Without children, there's no future for her, for her empire either. She can't remain as she is, but she's vowed to remain wedded to a dead husband. And so there's a great deal of instability within her. Remember, wh when we deal with princes and kings uh, and political leaders, they don't only, they're not only private individuals, they have a public role. And this is very important for Virgil. Leaders are not in the position where they can do just what they want individually. They have to think about the greater good. They have to think about the public. Think of Queen Elizabeth who just died. She couldn't just do what she wanted to do. That is her burden. Her burden is that she represents the public at all times, even in her private life. The, when she has children, it's a matter of national interest and importance. And her sister, Anna, answers, Sister, you more dear to me than light itself. Are you to lose all of your youth in dreary loneliness and never know sweet children or the soft rewards of Venus? Do you think... Sex. Venus, right? The soft word. Okay, just in case you didn't get. Are you too... Well, I assume. But I don't know if I can assume. Do you think that ashes or buried shades will care about such matters? Until Aeneas came, there was no suitor who moved your sad heart, not in Libya nor before in Tyre. You always scorned Iarbus and all the other chiefs that Africa, a region rich in triumphs, had to offer. 
How can you struggle now against a love that is so acceptable? Have you forgotten the land you settled, those who hem you in? On one side lie the towns of the Gaetolians, a race invincible, and the unbridled Numidians, and then the barbarous Sirtis. And on the other lies a barren country, stripped by the drought and by Barcaean raiders, raging both far and near. And I need not remind you of the wars that boil in Tyre, and of your brother's menaces and plots, for I am sure it was the work of gods and Juno that has held the Trojan galleys fast to their course and brought them here to Carthage. If you marry Aeneas, what a city and what a kingdom, sister, you will see. With Trojan arms beside us, so much greatness must lie in wait for Punic glory. Only pray to the gods for their goodwill and having presented them with proper sacrifices, be lavish with your Trojan guests and weave excuses for delay while frenzied winter storms out across the sea and shatters ships. While wet Orion blows his tempest squalls beneath the sky that is intractable. These words of Anna fed the fire in Dido. Note the response. Hope burned away her doubt, destroyed her shame. I'll stop there just for a second. There's a reference here, political context. Dido is in Libya. It talks about two uh, empires. One is the desert to the, in, across North Africa. Maybe, uh, you're on the Mediterranean coast. There is some fertile land there, but just below that there's a desert and all there are there are raiders. And on the other side are the Numidians and other African princes. And they are also a threat. Remember, this is a, a people that have just la landed in Carthage themselves. They are not, they're, they're not indigenous to this place. They've come from uh, Tyre, off the coast of Israel. They've come from there and they've only recently landed there. And when they landed there and she lost her husband, we're gonna find out that one of the African princes, Iarbus, proposed to marry her. Political alliance, you can be my wife. He thinks she's beautiful. He thinks this will be a good alliance and he's doing her a favor because he's on, she's on his territory. Let's be married. And she says no. And he actually accepts it. He doesn't force it. He lets it happen. But now Aeneas has landed and she's thinking about Aeneas. She's not thinking about the politics. You've, you've, so you've spurned the powerful native ruler and he's accepted this. And now you're going to take this guy who's just showed up and you're going to marry him and you're not going to think about all the political con consequences for it. And that is what's happened. And his, her, it's her sister, Anna, who persuades her that this is the good course of action. Note that the friends are not very friendly to her, her best interests here. It's her sister. And her sister's not hostile towards her. She just talks like a sister. She thinks like a sister. You're young. Why don't you have children? Right? Why do you have to be a widow for the rest of your life. Get married. They weren't suitable. He is suitable. Get on with it. And the words fire her desires. And they, as I say, they burn away her shame. And shame was for earlier on capitalized. It's as if that was a feature of her character that has been a good feature that has been done away with. Now she's shameless. And this is the problem. Because as a public figure, her reputation is being destroyed in the process. Without a good reputation in public, you can't act as a public figure. This is why public figures, if, you, if you're a politician and you want to uh, take the political office of another person, you attack their character. It's terrible. It's called an ad hominem, an argument. It's a bad way for a civilized society to govern themselves. You go after, sort of like in hockey, you play the body. You don't play the puck, you play the man, right? Or whatever sport. You go after the man. Never mind, there's a puck there. You just keep hitting them, you, you grind them down. Same here. You destroy the person's character. And when you destroy their character, no one will support that figure publicly. And that's what she's done to herself. This is, so she is her own enemy by being unwise in, as, a, as a politician. And remember, Aeneas 
is going to be the model figure for the politician of his day whose name is Augustus Caesar, the emperor. He will also have to do what is best in accordance not with his own desires but with what is best for Rome. And that will include who he gets to marry. That will include um, making on very uh, selfless decisions, but will be for there for the common good. But he says that hope burned away her doubt, destroyed her shame. First they move on from shrine to shrine, imploring the favor of the gods at every altar. They so now they're, before she just dismissed it out of hand, she even swore an oath. Now they're going and praying to the gods for the gods to help them and answer their prayers, but their prayers are all inclined towards what she's just sworn she would not do. And who do they pray to? Ceres, the lawgiver, Phoebus, that is Apollo, Father Bacchus, the wine god, but also the god of love, and above all, to Juno, guardian of marriage. Okay, Juno's their, the main goddess here, right? But note that these, that these, these, uh, uh, gods that they're praying to are not arbitrary. Ceres, the lawgiver, is also the god of the harvest and grain and fertility then and, and fruitfulness. They're thinking about children. Uh, Phoebus, uh, Apollo, the sun god, the god of light and, and music and art and so forth, they pray to him. Bacchus, of course, because of the sexual element, but above all, to Juno. They want marriage here. They don't want an affair. They want a marriage. That's their aim. Lovely Dido holds the cup in her right hand, pours the offering herself midway between a milk-white heifer's horns. She studies uh, slit breasts of beasts and reads their throbbing guts. So this is um, what, uh, it's not the equivalent of palm reading, but it's like that. You, you, you read the entrails of animals. Augury, you, re, you watch the flight of the birds. Uh, this is a different thing. It's something to a degree what Abraham does in Genesis 15. He cuts the animals in half and he walks between them. It's part of a ritual, but here it's a little bit more. It's like, uh, it's like a bit like palm reading. You're trying to read in the future by cutting animals open and reading their entrails. So she's trying to see what the future holds. But oh, the ignorance of augurs, says Virgil. How can vows and altars help one wild with love? Meanwhile, that's just Virgil's remark. Like it, it, you think, where does that voice come from? That's Virgil, the author, interceding and speaking of the folly of the woman who's making these rites uh, and, and following the process of being religious while she's actually irrational. How can vows and altars help one wild with love? Meanwhile, the supple flame devours her marrow, the innermost of her bones. Within her breast, the silent wound lives on because she'd been shot by Cupid's arrow back in the third book. At Juno's behest, that's what's happened because Venus sees that there's an opportunity here to bring down her rival. And so she gets little fat Cupid to shoot an arrow into Dido and, she, and, and, the, and the, she's wounded by it, but it wounded not physically, but in her, her soul. And, the, de, and the, the, she said, uh, and now we get an epic simile. Across the city, she wanders in her frenzy, even as a heedless hind, that is a deer, hit by an arrow when a shepherd drives for game with darts among the Cretan woods, and unawares from far leaves winging steel inside her flesh. She roams the forest and the wooded slopes of Dicte, the shaft of death still clinging to her side. So Dido leads Aeneas round the ramparts, displays the wealth of Sidon and the city ready to hand. She starts to speak, then falters and stops in mid-speech. In mid now day glides away, Again, insane, she seeks out that same banquet. Again, she prays to hear the trials of Troy. Again, she hangs upon the teller's lips. But now the guests are gone. So there's an, an epic simile here, a comparison between an, a deer that's been hit by the shaft of an arrow that's, that has killed her and Queen Dido. 
and we're already getting dramatic foreshadowing. The queen is already dead while she's walking around. She just doesn't realize it yet. And she's in a frenzy. She's given over to her passions. This is the exact thing that Virgil is most strongly discouraging his readers from doing. You must not give in to your passions. You must keep a level head. <clears throat> Don't be like Dido. But what's the effect of this? Uh, line 113, her towers rise no more. The young of Carthage no longer exercise at arms or build their harbors or sure battlements for war. The works are idle, broken off. The massive menacing rampart walls, even the crane, the fire of the city now lie neglected. So the city stops being built. She ignores her public duties and the city seems to stop along with the queen. But nice little touch uh, a few lines before this. When uh, Aeneas is away, his little boy is there and the boy who looks like the father, she uh, is sitting there fondling the boy, caressing his hair as if it were the father. And, and so she, she, absent she sees, she hears the absent one or draws Ascanius, that's the boy's name, his son and counterfeit into her arms as if his shape might cheat her untellable love. And as soon as Jove's dear wife, now that's uh, Juno, remember this is her goddess, sees that her Dido is in the grip of such a scourge and that no honor can withstand this madness, then the daughter of Saturn faces Venus. Two goddesses, and they're about to have a slap out fight here, right? We got Venus on the one side, we got Juno on the other. How remarkable indeed. What splendid spoils you carry off, you and your boy. How grand and memorable is the glory if one woman is beaten by the guile of two gods. I have not been blind. I know you fear our fortresses. You have been suspicious of the houses of high Carthage. But what end will come of all this hate? Let us be done with wrangling. Let us make, instead of war, an everlasting peace and plighted wedding. You have what you were bent upon. She burns with love. The frenzy now is in her bones. Then let us rule this people, you and I, with equal auspices. Let Dido serve a Phrygian husband. Phrygia is a, uh, in that area where Troy is in Turkey. Let her serve a Phrygian husband. Let her give her Tyrians and her pledged dowry into your right hand. But Venus read behind the words of Juno the motive she had hid to shunt the kingdom of Italy to Libyan shores. And so she answered Juno, who is mad enough to shun the terms you offer? Who would prefer to strive with you in war if only fortune favor the course you urge? For I am ruled by fates and am unsure if Jupiter would have the Trojans and the men of Tyre become one city if he likes the mingling of peoples and the writing of such trees. But, but you are his wife, and it is right for you to try his mind, to entreat him. Go, I'll follow. Queen Juno answered him, that task is mine. But listen now while in few words I try to tell you how I mean to bring about this urgent matter. When tomorrow's Titan first shows his rays of light, the Titan is the sun. When he first shows his rays of light, reveals the world, Aeneas an unhappy Dido plan to hunt together in the forest. Then, while horsemen hurry to surround the glades, with nets I shall pour down a black rain cloud and in which I have mixed hail to awaken all the heavens with my thundering. Their comrades will scatter under cover of thick night. Both Dido and the Trojan chief will reach their shelter in the same cave. I shall be there. And if I can rely on your goodwill, I shall unite the two in certain marriage and seal her as Aeneas's very own. And this shall be their wedding. Cytheria, which is another name for Juno, or, or for um, Venus, said nothing to oppose the plan. She granted what Juno wanted, smiling at its cunning. So she agrees. Let them go off, let them go to a cave, 
you let you bring about a thunderstorm, they'll go into the cave and then they'll be married. This sounds very agreeable. Okay. There's a problem with this proposal. What's the problem? There are only two of them there in the cave. These are two public figures in a private act. There's no witnesses to it. They're acting as if they're private citizens, as if they could, they could follow their heart's desires rather than the good of their two kingdoms. And there are no witnesses to this marriage, and it isn't a marriage. A private marriage is no marriage at all. It has public significance. By the, this is obviously the case for a king and a queen, but it would be the case uh, in Canada as well or any other country where marriage is honored. It is a public act. It needs to be witnessed in public. It's a private act brought into the public. It must be seen in the public. It has public standing. What happens in the family has public consequences. It will result in a marriage. The marriage will resi result in children. There's a, there's a status that goes with the children born in wedlock and outside of wedlock. There's a status that goes with it, legitimacy, um, inheritance, all these sorts of things. And so it needs to be done in public. They don't do it in public, they do it in private. This is no marriage at all. Venus has gone along with this because she knows that Juno has proposed something very stupid against her own best interests. But it will serve Venus's interests. So by all means, let them have a marriage, if you will, or a wedding. Meanwhile, Aurora rose, she left the ocean, and when her brightness fills the air, select young men move from the gates with wide mesh nets. By the way, this public act remains, uh, it, it's, it's the case in Canada that you have to have a witness at your wedding. And, um, and the, it used to be the case that the bans of marriage would be read. Is there any reason why this man should not lawfully marry this woman? You know, and at that point, people come forward and will either say there is a reason, well, because he's married to that other woman, right? Or she's married to, or whatever, or like, is there a reason why this? And then, then it proceeds. Well, because the law, which is the public decora declaration of justice in a kingdom, is going to follow on with the legitimacy of the marital act as well. It all sort of hangs together. So a lot is uh, consequent on this action here. But they go out, there is the thunderstorm. And turmoil. And they go. And they go into the cave. Line 218. Dido and the Trojan chieftain have reached the same cave. Primal Earth and Juno, queen of marriages, together now give the signal. Lightning fires flash. The upper air is witness to their mating. And from the highest hilltops shout the nymphs. That day was her first day of death and ruin. You would have thought, the marriage. She got everything she wanted. Juno has signed off on it. That day, says Virgil, was the first day of death and ruin. Her first day. For neither how things seem, nor how they are deemed, moves Dido now, and she no longer thinks of furtive love, for Dido calls it marriage. And with this name, she covers up her fault. Then, the famous passage, then swiftest of all evils, rumor runs. Note that rumor is capitalized as if rumor were a person. It's called personification of an abstract thing. Here it's rumor. Rumor runs straightway through Libya's mighty cities. Rumor, whose life is speed, whose going gives her force. Timid and small at first, she soon lifts up her body in the air. She stalks the ground. Her head is hidden in the clouds. Provoked to anger at the gods, her mother, earth gives birth to her. Last come, they say, as sister to Caius and Enceladus. Fast-footed and lithe of wing, she is a terrifying, enormous monster with as many feathers as she has sleepless eyes beneath each feather. Amazingly, as many sounding tongues and mouths and raises up as many ears. Between the earth and sky, she flies by night, screeching towards the darkness, and she never closes her eyes in gentle sleep. By day, she sits as sentinel on some steep roof 
or on high towers frightening vast cities, for she holds fast to falsehood and distortion as often as to messages of truth. Now she was glad, that was rumor, she filled the ears of all with many tales. She sang of what was done and what was fiction, chanting that Aeneas, one born of Trojan blood, had come, that lovely Dido has deigned to join herself to him, that now, in lust, forgetful of their kingdom, they take long pleasure, fondling through the winter, the slaves of squalid craving, such reports the filthy goddess scatters everywhere upon the lips of men. At once she turns her course to King Iarbas, remember the African king, and his spirit is hot. His anger rages at her words. So note this portrait of rumor. Rumor is like fake news. But it's not just fake news, it's just rumor. It goes around. It has as many mouths as it does eyes. It never sleeps. It spreads it all. Think of rumor in the light of social media and how this works. It lights everything on fire and it polarizes. It tells truth, it tells falsehood, it tells everything. It doesn't distinguish between the two. It's a, fact, it's a magnificent portrait of what rumor actually does. Uh, in scripture, it talks about needing to guard the tongue because by it, the very uh, gates of hell are opened. A person's life is set on fire. So guard your tongue. James 3, thereabouts, that extended passage. Uh, Virgil seems to be talking about the same sort of thing, the power of the tongue. And the reason that she's open to this is because she says they're married, but nobody else knows this. It looks like the two are just having licentious sex. They're just away doing whatever they want to do. She doesn't know that they're, nobody else knows that they're married. She knows, Venus knows, Aeneas knows, but no one else. And so in the gap between the truth and what the public sees, a great deal of rumors can arise. And the result of this is that her neighbor to the east, Yarbus, is outraged. Yarbus was the son of Haman by a ravished nymph of Garamantia. In his broad realm, he had built a hundred temples, a hundred handsome shrines for Jupiter. There he had consecrated sleepless fire, the everlasting watchman of the gods. The soil was rich with blood of slaughtered herds and varied garlands flowered on the thresholds. Insane, incited by that bitter rumor, he prayed long, so they say, to Jupiter. He stood before the altars in the presence of gods, a suppliant with upraised hands, all able Jove, to whom the Moorish nation, feasting upon their figured couches, poor Linnaean sacrifices. Do you see these things? Or, Father, are we only trembling for nothing when you cast your twisting thunder? Those fires in the clouds that terrify our souls, are they but blind and aimless lightning that only stirs our empty mutterings. A woman wandering within our borders paid for the right to build a tiny city. We gave her shore to till and terms of tenure. She has refused to marry me. She has taken Aeneas as a lord into her lands. And now this second Paris with his crew of half men with his chin and his greasy hair, bound up beneath a bonnet of Maonia, enjoys his prey while we bring offerings to what we have believed to be your temples, still cherishing your empty reputation. He's angry. And look at this Aeneas. He calls him a second Paris, of, uh, like the one who took um, Helen of Troy. He's a man with, he's a, he's a soft man. He's a, he's a girl, he wears a bonnet, he's got greasy hair. Like he's, here, here's Yarbus, I'm a real man and look at this guy. Like this guy, she, he's outraged. His, his sense of masculinity is offended by that. This is, what he's, this is what is going on in this passage. And as he prays and clutched the altar stone, all able Jupiter heard him 
and turned his eyes upon the royal walls, upon the lovers who had forgotten their good name. He speaks to Mercury. By the way, both of them, both Aeneas and uh, Dido, are culpable here. Both of them have lost their sense of decorum. The gods are outraged. Remember, he's supposed to go there, she's supposed to go here. There's not supposed to be this marriage happening. And so he speaks to Mercury, commanding him, be on your way, my son, call up the zephyrs, the winds, glide on your wings, speak to the Dardan chieftain who lingers now at Tyrian Carthage, paying not one jot of attention to the cities the fates have given him. Mercury, carry across the speeding winds the words I urge. His lovely mother did not promise such a son to us. She did not save him twice from Grecian arms for this, but to be master of Italy, a land that teems with empire and seethes with war, to father a race from Toysers, high blood, to place all earth beneath his laws. There's what Rome's destiny is. It's to be an empire, to put the whole earth under its laws. This is what Augustus says about Rome. This is a place in which law reigns. But if the brightness of such deeds is not enough to kindle him, note the reference to a flame again, if he cannot attempt the task for his own fame, does he, a father, grudge Ascanius the walls of Rome? Ascanius is his son. If he, if he doesn't care about his own reputation, if he doesn't care about the fame of being the founder of the Roman Empire, how about his boy? What is he pondering? What hope can hold him here among his enemies? Not caring for his own Ausonian sons or for Lavinian fields. Lavinia is in Italy. He must set sail. And this is all. My message lies in this. And so now Mercury goes on just like he did in the Odyssey. Remember in the Odyssey, it was not, uh, he was not called Mercury, he was called what? You remember? Mars. Not Mars. Mars is the god of war, it's still Roman. Hermes. Hermes, yep, same figure. Just a different name. The Romans and the Greeks have the same gods, they have different names. So Hermes is the messenger of the gods. Mercury is the messenger of the gods. Mercury and Venus and so forth get associated with the planets as well, right? in the Roman uh, understanding. Um, associated, but not identified, still. Um, but he goes on, he takes his wand, he goes down, and he calls up the spirits from the Orcus, and down to dreary Tartarus sends others, and he uses this to give sleep and recall it, to unseal the eyes of those who have died, and up he goes, and he goes, and he speaks to Aeneas. And what does he say? He attacks at once, 353. Are you now laying the foundation of high Carthage, a servant to a woman, building her a splendid city here? Are you forgetful of what is your own kingdom, your own fate? The very God of gods, whose power sways both earth and heaven, sends me down to you from bright Olympus. He himself has asked me to carry these commands through the swift air. What are you pondering or hoping for while squandering your ease in Libyan lands? For if the brightness of such deeds is not enough to kindle you, if you cannot attempt the task of your own fame, remember Ascanius growing up, the hopes you hold for Eulus, your own heir. Same character, by the way, Ascanius is Eulus. Different way of referring to his son. To whom are owed the realm of Italy and the land of Rome? The, the name Eulus is more significant because he is the first of the Julii, the family that bears the name the Julius. After Julius Caesar, he's part of that long line. It's a noble Roman family that goes back to the very origins of the Roman civilization, the Julius. And Augustus has been adopted by Julius. So this is, Jul this is Augustus's own son. If you don't care about yourself, think about the great emperor who will follow you through your son. This vision stunned Aeneas, struck him dumb. His terror held his hair 
erect, his voice held fast within his jaws. He burns to flee from Carthage. He would quit these pleasant lands, astonished by such warnings, the command of gods. What can he do? And now comes the problem. With what words dare he face the frenzied queen? <laughs> it's clear what he has to do. I got to get out of here. I'm ready to leave immediately. But now, what do I say to Dido? What openings can he employ? His wits are split. They shift here, there. They race to different places, turning to everything. But as he hesitated, this seemed the better plan. He calls Sergestus and Menestheus and strong Serestus, and he asks them to equip the fleet in silence, to muster their companions on the shore, to ready all their arms, but to conceal the reasons for this change while he himself, with gracious Dido, still aware of nothing and never dreaming such a love could ever be broken, would try out approaches, seek the tenderest, most tactful time for speech, whatever dexterous way might suit his case. And all are glad. They race to carry out the orders of Aeneas, his commands. The other uh, Trojans want not to be here. They want to go to Italy. They're stuck because Aeneas has been negligent in his duties so far. So he gives the orders, get ready to sail, and I'll go find a way of speaking to Dido. But Dido, for who can deceive a lover, has, had caught his craftiness. She quickly sensed what was to come. However safe they seemed, she feared all things. That same unholy rumor brought her these hectic tidings that the boats were being armed, made fit for voyaging. Her mind is helpless, raging fr frantically, inflamed. She raves through the city just as a bacante. When each second year she is startled by the shaking of the sacred emblems, the orgies drive her on. The cry of, oh, Bacchus, calls to her by night. Citheron incites her with its clamor. And at last, Dido attacks Aeneas with these words. All of these references to lust and the goddess of lust, the Bacchus, uh, and the Maenads that followed Bacchus, the, the wine god, uh, uh, were participated in, in orgiastic rites, sexual rites, and they tore people apart in their frenzy. And this is how she's portrayed. And now she comes at Virgil, or Virgil, at Aeneas with these words, deceiver. Did you even hope to hide so harsh a crime to leave this land of mine without a word? Can nothing hold you back, neither your love, the hand you pledge, nor even the cruel death that lies in wait for Dido? Beneath the winter sky, are you preparing a fleet to rush away across the deep among the north winds? You who have no feeling, what, even if you were not seeking out strange fields and unknown dwellings, even if your ancient Troy were still erect, would you return to Troy across such stormy seas? Do you flee me? By tears, by your right hand, this sorry self is left with nothing else. By wedding, by the marriage we began. If I did anything deserving of you or anything of mine was sweet to you, take pity on a fallen house, put off your plan, I pray, if there is still space for prayers. Because of you, the tribes of Libya, all the nomad princes hate me. Even my own Tyrians are hostile. And for you, my honor is gone. And that good name that once was mine, my only claim to reach the stars. My guest, to whom do you consign this dying woman? I must say, guest, this name is all I have of one whom once I called my husband. Then why do I live on until Pug Pygmalion, my brother, batters down my walls and until Iarbus, the Gaetulian, takes me prisoner? Had I at least before you left conceived a son in me, if there were but a tiny Aeneas playing by me in the hall, 
whose face, in spite of everything, might yet remind me of you, then indeed I should not seem so totally abandoned, beaten. Her words were ended. But Aeneas, warned by Jove, held still his eyes. He struggled, pressed care back within his breast. With halting words, he answers her at last. I never shall deny what you deserve, the kindnesses that you could tell. I never shall regret remembering Elissa for as long as I remember my own self, as long as breath is king over these limbs. I'll speak brief words that fit the case. I never hoped to hide. Do not imagine that, my flight. I am not furtive. I have never held the wedding torches as a husband. I have never entered into such agreements. What? You know, the marriage? I never got married. What are you talking about? I never did that. If fate had granted me to guide my life by my own auspices and to unravel my troubles with unhampered will, then I should cherish first the town of Troy, the sweet remains of my own people, and the tall roofs of tops of Priam's would remain. My hand would plant again a second Pergamus for my defeated men. But now, Grinian Apollo's oracles would have me seize great Italy. The Lycian prophecies tell me of Italy. There is my love. There is my homeland. If the fortresses of Carthage and the vision of a city in Libya can hold you, who are Phoenician, why then begrudge the Trojans settling on Ausonian soil? There is no harm. It is right that we too seek out a foreign kingdom, etc. His response to her is to say that they were never married and that he has a high duty that he has to fulfill directly contradicts all the action that he's just undertaken. We are not to regard Aeneas as noble in his character. We are to indict both of them for their deplorable conduct together. So what we must not see when we see Dido being indicted by Virgil for giving in to her lust, we must not see is uh, Aeneas being given a a whitewash treatment. He's also held guilty for doing this, but at the end of the day, he sets that aside for the sake of duty. So what this makes him, and this is what is so very different from Odysseus and Achilles, is it makes him a very complex hero. It makes him difficult to like. He's not heroic in everything he does. In fact, it almost seems like there is more to look down upon than to admire in Aeneas. But, and this is the big but, at the end of the day, he is pious in Aeneas and he does his duty. And so he's a very realistic hero. And realistic heroes are not ones that we admire. But at the end of the day, he says to Dido 491, stop your quarrel. No longer set yourself and me afire. Stop your quarrel. It is not my own free will that leads to Italy. He's doing what's fated. I have to do this. You need to grow up effectively. Stop acting like you have no control over the situation. Grow up. But all the while Aeneas spoke, she stared askance at him. Her glance ran this way, that. She scans his body with her silent eyes. Then Dido thus, inflamed, denounces him. No goddess was your mother, false Aeneas, and Dardanus no author of your race. The bristling Caucasus was father to you on his harsh crags. Hyrcanian tigresses gave you their teats. And why must I dissemble? Why hold myself in check? 
for greater wrongs? For did Aeneas groan when I was weeping? Did he once turn his eyes or overcome, shed tears, or pity me, who was his loved one? What shall I cry out first, and what shall follow? No longer now does mighty Juno or our father, son of Saturn, watch this earth with righteous eyes. Nowhere is certain trust. He was an outcast on the shore. In want, he's talking about Aeneas, I took him in and madly let him share my kingdom. His lost fleet and his companions I saved from death. Oh, I am whirled along in fire by the Furies. The Furies are, are in the underworld. They're demonic figures. And she is in the grip of this. She's mad because of the, the uh, unmerited favor that she's so, shown this man who spat in her face and destroyed her. First, the augur Apollo, then the Lycian oracles, and now sent down by Jove himself the god's own herald, carrying his horrid orders. This seems indeed to be the wor a work for high ones, a care that can disturb their calm. I do not refute your words. I do not keep you back. Go then before the winds to Italy. Seek out your kingdom overseas. Indeed, if there be pious power still, I hope that you will drink your torments to the lease among sea rocks and drowning often cry the name of Dido. Then, although absent, I will hunt you down with blackened firebrands. And when chill death divides my soul and body, a shade I shall be present everywhere. Depraved, you then will pay your penalties and I shall hear of it. And that report will come to me below among the shadows. She is bent on death and she's gonna see him in death. It's, it's she's a little bit angry. <laughs> Her speech is broken off, heartsick. She shuns the light of day, deserts his eyes. She turns away, leaves him in fear and hesitation. Aeneas, longing still to say so much, as Dido faints, her servants lift her up and they carry her into the marble chamber and they lay her body down upon the couch. Now, what does Virgil say in response to this? Now, this is, becomes an epic trope. Uh, epic poets will do what Virgil does here. And it is to interject the poet's voice into the narrative. We have a narrative here. The narrator is telling us what the figures say. And note that it's largely dialogue between the characters. So there's a little bit of descriptive prose, but it's largely dialogue that is moving the narrative upon. It gives us a revelation of the characters and so forth. It's what makes it inherently dramatic. But what we don't know is what the narrator himself thinks, except at certain points. And this is one of them, line 561. And we will find that epic poets do this. Homer himself did it. Remember, he did it with uh, Eumaeus the swineherd. Oh, Eumaeus, my swineherd. Suddenly we're aware that somebody's telling the story, and here we have Virgil himself doing it. What were your feelings, Dido, then? 561. What were the sighs you uttered at that night, at that sight, when far and wide from your high citadel you saw the beaches boil and turmoil take the waters, with such a vast uproar before your eyes? Voracious love, to what do you not drive the hearts of men. Again, she must outcry. Again, a suppliant must plead with him, must bend her pride to love, and so not die in vain with some way still left untried. And now she goes to her sister and asks for a way out. She can't put it behind her because she's possessed by love. And Virgil sees, Virgil the poet sees love as the enemy of the entire human race. It drives us mad. It makes us irrational. It leads us down to the underworld and the fires and the furies that reign there. So she speaks to the, set, to the sister to try and help her out. to try and plead with Aeneas to change his mind. And yet his mind cannot be moved. And 620, 
Maddened by the fates, unhappy Dido calls out at last for death. It tires her to see the curve of heaven. That she may not weaken in her plan to leave the light she sees while placing offerings on the altars with burning incense, terrible to tell, the consecrated liquid turning black, the outpoured wine becoming obscene blood. But no one learns of this, not even Anna, and more, inside her palace she had built a marble temple to her former husband and she, that she held dear and honored wonderfully. She wreathed that shrine with snow-white fleeces and holy day leaves. And when the world was seized, by night she seemed to hear the voice and words of her dead husband calling out to Dido, calling her to come to him. And now she sees, like Pentheus, even as Pentheus, line 647, epic simile, even as Pentheus, when he is seized by frenzy, sees files of furies and a double sun and double Thebes appear. To remember Thebes? We just saw where uh, uh, Oedipus was. Or when Orestes, son of Agamemnon, driven across the stage, flees from his mother armed with torches and black serpents on the threshold, the awful goddesses of vengeance squat. References to uh, passages that we've already been acquainted with. She goes down and what does she do? She uh, pledges herself to death. And so I'll pick it up at 697. When they open sky inside the center court, the pyre rises high. What does she, she says, she says to her sister, you know what? I'm going to deal with Aeneas once and for all. You know how I'm going to do? I'm going to burn all his stuff. All the clothes he's left behind his armor, build me a fire and I am going to burn every memory of him and then I'll get past him and Anathet. Oh, this is good. She's moving on. We're, that's what we'll do. So burn, get the, the pyre of the fire flame very high and it's a ruse to get her sister to do this and to think that she's beyond it, and then she does what she intends to do, which is to throw herself upon it. For when the open sky inside the central court, the pyre rises high and huge, with logs of pine and planks of ilex, the queen, not ignorant of what is coming, then wreathes the place with garlands, crowning it with greenery of death. And on the couch above, she sets the clothes Aeneas wore, the sword he left, and then, his effigy, she's going to burn him in effigy. Before the circling altars, the enchantress, her hair disheveled, stands as she invokes aloud 300 gods, especially Chaos and Erebus and Hecate, the triple-shaped Diana, three-faced virgin. Hecate, by the way, in Christian um, uh, symbolism represents uh, Satan. She's a witch. Hecate. Mentioned in Macbeth, by the way. And she had also sprinkled waters that would counterfeit the fountain of Avernus. She gathered herbs cut by the brazen sickles beneath the moonlight, juicy with the venom of black milk. She had also found a love charm torn from before the forehead of a newborn foal before his mother snatched it. Dido herself with salt cake in her holy hands, her girdle unfastened, and one foot free of its sandal, close by the altars and about to die. This is the portrait of a woman gone mad. Her hair is disheveled. It's not in its bound. It's, it's, it's blowing wildly in the wind. She has one sandal going off. She's in the throes of passion. But the passion here is not of lust, but of insanity. About to die, she calls upon the gods and stars who know the fates as witness. Then she prays to any power there may be who is both just and watchful, who cares for those who love without requital. Night. And across the earth, the tired bodies were tasting tranquil sleep. And on she goes. And she has this interior monologue. What shall I do here? What shall I do here? And then comments of herself does uh, uh, Mercury, rather, to uh, Aeneas, who's still lingering, 776. You, God is born, how can you lie asleep at such a crisis? Madman, can't you see the threats around you? Can't you hear the breath of kind west winds? 
She, that is Dido, conjures injuries and awful crimes. She means to die. She stirs the shifting surge of restless anger. Why not flee this land headlong while there is time? You soon will see the waters churned by wreckage, ferocious torches blaze and beaches flame. If morning finds you lingering on this coast, be on your way. Enough delays, an ever uncertain and inconstant thing is woman. Comment here on the relation or the nature of the two sexes, very uh, sexist in its language, we would say, but associating women with the passions and men with reasoning. Um, we're not to take this as doctrinal, by the way, but a comment here. And Aeneas is terrified to leave the shores. And Dido uh, puts herself on the flame, uh, 910, and says uh, that she mounts, uh, so 894, she mounts in madness that high pyre, the fire, unsheathes the Dardan sword, Aeneas's, a gift not sought for such an end. And when she saw the Trojans' clothes and her familiar bed, she checked her thought and tears a little, lay upon the couch and spoke her final words, O oh, relics, dear, while fate and God allowed, receive my spirit and free me from these cares. For I have lived and journeyed through the course assigned by fortune, not fate, but fortune. And now my shade will pass. Illustrious beneath the earth, I have built a handsome city, have seen my walls right up, avenged a husband, won satisfaction from a hostile brother. Oh, fortunate, too fortunate, if only the ships of Troy had never touched our coasts. She spoke and pressed her face into the couch. I shall die unavenged, but I shall die, she says. Thus, thus I gladly go below to shadows. May the savage Darden drink with his own eyes this fire from the deep and take with him the omen of my death. So she curses him as she dies. Then Dido's words were done and her companions can see her fallen on the sword. The blade is foaming with her blood. Her hands are bloodstained. Now clamor rises to the high rooftop. Now rumor riots through the startled city. The lamentations, keening, shrieks of women sound through the houses. Heavens echo mighty wailings, even as if an enemy were entering the gates, and all of Carthage or ancient Tyre in ruins, and angry fires rolling across the homes of men and gods. And Anna, her sister, heard. Appalled and breathless, she runs anxious through the crowd, her nails wounding her face, her fists, her breasts. She calls the dying Dido by name. And was it then for this, my sister, did you plan this fraud for me? Was this the meaning waiting for me when the pyre, the flames, the altar were prepared? What shall I now deserted first lament? You scorned your sister's company in death. You should have called me to the fate you met. The same sword pain, the same hour should have taken the two of us away. Anna's also gone crazy. Did my own hands help build the pyre and did my own voice call upon our father's gods only to find me heartless far away when you lay dying? You have destroyed yourself and me, my sister, the people and the elders of your side and, and all your city. Anyway, um, then all able Juno, 955, pitied her, long sorrow and hard death, and from Olympus sent Iris down to free the struggling spirit from her entwining limbs. For as she died, a death that was not merited or fated. Note that she was fortune. She, this was her choice. She didn't have to die here. There's, a, there's room in here within fate in the Greek, or rather the Roman understanding for fortune, a little bit arbitrary, a little bit fickle, but not fated. She chose to take her own life before it was time. It was not merited or fated, but miserable and before her time and spurred by sudden frenzy. Proserpina had not yet cut a gold lock from her crown, not yet assigned her life to Stygian Orcus. On saffron wings do glittering iris slides down the sky, drawing a thousand shifting colors across the facing sun. She halted above the head of Dido, 
so commanded, I take this lock as offering to this. I free you from your body. So she speaks and cuts the lock with her right hand. At once the warmth is gone. The life passed to the winds. So she takes her life on, in an unti untimely fashion. So note that we have room here for fate and also fortune. Not the same thing. Not the same thing. There's a sense of arbitrariness. There's a fate that determines things, but there's also a sense that there's a little bit of leeway within that. You can, take, you can lose your life earlier than fated. You can't extend it beyond what's fated, but you can take it away earlier, depending on it. Note that it was not merited. She didn't deserve to die. She didn't have to die. She chose to die. Uh, Virgil, who has no objection, ob objections to suicide, will, uh, it's unclear where he would stand on this because the motivation for suicide amongst the Stoics is to prevent your soul from being thrown out of equanimity. But she is in distress, in passion. She's irrational. That's not why she's taking her own life. I don't think Virgil approves of this at all. This is a crazy death. It's how you receive your death that matters to Virgil. And Dido is the example of how not to die. The antithesis of the Roman uh, here. Do you have a question, comment at the back? I, really, I think we're out of time here. I'll pick it up next time. We're going to move on to ver uh, book six, and we'll look at the underworld. I want to take considerable time to look at Virgil's underworld, and we will uh, make some observations about it. We'll do a little comparison also with, uh, with Homer. Uh, which we also looked at. And then I w I'd like to just reflect also a little bit on the pagan view of the afterlife and then compare it to Christian views on that. I think it's interesting.